All right, KISS Army, welcome to the KISS FAQ Podcast. Thank you for giving us your time today and letting us into your head. I hope we don't do any damage. This is a KISS-related podcast by the board for the board. We hope that you enjoy. We'd love you to support this show. Please like, follow, and subscribe to us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Your likes and subscription helps us to grow and attract interviews and content. So please retweet and share our posts. Your contributions are appreciated. Welcome to episode 444 of the KISS FAQ podcast. I'm your host, Julian Gill. Today we're joined by, or I'm joined by, Lonnie St. Louis KISS. What's up? Uh, 69th Blizzard Ken. Hello. And Marcus Almighty Mark. We are creatures of the board still. We're going to continue <laughs> celebrating the 40th anniversary edition of Creatures of the Night. You know, going to take on some topics, um, which were responses to our last episode, which of course was live. Um, for a lot of people, I'm surprised by how many people joined us on a Saturday morning, afternoon, evening, depending on wherever you are, uh, to join us live is just always really cool, so it is very much appreciated. Um, when you, you do that, we'll be doing another Saturday episode before too long so that Daniel can join us while we continue our album death match with the next matchup. Oh dear, that'll be fun. Mm-hmm. So, new purchases. Anything, anyone bought any Kiss stuff this week that isn't Creatures related? Mm. No. Mm. I didn't. Oh shit, can I reach it? <laughs> Oh, nice. About publicity photos from Animalize. Um, just because. I also got the <clears> Record <throat> Store Day Origins Volume 2. And I'm really well chuffed that they included the liner notes as an insert in there. Because obviously I did do those. So I've now framed that up. Put my check-in from E1. And that's going to go mm. up on the wall. Because uh, that's about all a picture disc is good for. So, yeah. So I did go down to the store and I bought the rest of the Kiss stuff uh, for the Creatures of the Night. I decided I wanted the slip mat. So I went down to Amoeba in San Francisco and they only had three slip mats left. So I got there at the right time. Um, I bought the uh, Half Speed Master of that. And let me just see if I can hold that up. I think Ken talked about that a bit last week, but... <clears throat> I'm not opening this. Mm-hmm. I have no desire to play vinyl. It's just too inconvenient what I have to go through. Um, and, and then after being in the UPS or FedEx system for ages, mm-hmm. the triple blue vinyl. Now, I got to say, I'm super impressed by this color. I'm going to see if I can uh, get the LP out because... You like the color. I love the color. I mean, nice. I think you don't really cool. get a good backlight on my uh, my non-reflective because of my stupid imitation background. Uh, but I am very pleased with that color, and I think it looks better than the light blue that was, you know, kind of advertised in the mock-up. I think it came out wonderfully. The dust sleeves in this are super thick, grayed. Yeah. Um, uh, but I but I do have a complaint about the dust my sleeve. Look at look at the, how shoddy a job they did on mine. Well, you don't like them anyway, Mark, because they don't have PVC liners in them. Yes, yeah. that's true. But but that's it's uh, come on. Yeah. I mean, that's that's like way off. Okay, like look at that. Come on. Well, welcome to the industrial age. Darn it! Manufacturing but, issues do occur. But I will say, it, the the material is nice. The, the 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 packaging, the whole thing. I was very. Very impressed. It was good. I, the booklet is fantastic too. I would have preferred the other color, though, vinyl. Would you? That was advertised. <clears throat> would you? False advertising. Are you angry? Do you hate I'm not this? angry. But I just would have preferred. I, I know how vinyl. You know, when you go to buy a colored vinyl or whatever, it sh- they show it one way and then you get it, and it's like uh, the first Kiss album. You get the. <laughs> It was supposed to be some kind of splatter, whatever, and there was like a. It turned out white oh, with I one little black, black dot in there. Well, <laughs> you know, yeah, at least, it, at least it doesn't look like Bukaki, right? Oh, P- yes. Pig- pigeon shit colored <laughs> vinyl. True. Lonnie, we're a week in now since the show, and you've been living with creatures since mm-hmm. then. How much has it taken over your life for a week, or did you immediately it- go back to use your illusion? No, no, no. I've been, I've, <laughs> I have been, I, I have been, I've been a little mixing it up between the two of them. Like up until last, like leading up until the show last week, I was like, okay, I got to put this illusion aside. 
because I have to focus on creatures because we're doing the show. Um, and I've been kind of back and forth with with the two of them mainly is what I've been listening to um, since that show. But those creatures, the, the creatures, the album is really good. And the, the live shows, and you know, and you know, I was able to get those leaks, you know, that came out, you know, a few months ago, whatever. But the way, my, the biggest impression I have after two weeks is the way they compiled those live shows together. And it to me, it just. And, and but it's, it's it's like an alive, but it's not like an alive because there are like the there's more, you know, rap and stuff, ramps and things like that in between. I feel, um, especially with like naming out the city and that like an alive album, they would have they would have edited that portion out. But it is like what, but at the same time, it is like what an alive type album would have been if they like let's let's just say Creature Store had been successful and the Creatures album sold really well. You could you could have seen them doing an alive type album at that time even because it had been a few albums since they had done one. They had this new lineup. Um, you know, it, it kind of sounds like what it could have sound like. Uh, I that's the part I've really been enjoying more than anything is that can those two compiled live those two compiled live discs four and five. You know, I think they were actually contractually allowed to do a live <coughs> album as well at that point. Yeah, uh, with that so being that. the third studio release, or I don't I know, if, or I don't know if they counted um, Unmasked because it was grandfathered in under the Casablanca <laughs> contract. I think Phonogram. Well, the Elder. Well, you needed to have three studios, so yeah. um, Elder would have been but, the first. But they had like returned to their roots, like, and they're like, they were they were turning back into a metal type band, and I think they were really proud of the direction they were headed in. And it kind of, if you think about it, that's kind of what they did with Revenge, though, too. They turned back into a harder metal band, and they were proud of the direction they were going. And so they did an alive album. You know, I could you could really see them had Creatures sold well, and had they even you know not been thinking about taking up the makeup and continuing to be in transition, which is a byproduct of the tour not being successful and the album not being successful. But had they been successful, you could have seen them doing an alive album at that point in their career. Yeah, you raise a really interesting point about the analogs between Creatures and Revenge, both a very strong um, albums, very much put on a pedestal by the fans, but mm -hmm. both are commercial failures. Correct. Yeah, so very good, very good points there, Lonnie. Let's dig into some of the, the, the comments because it's going to feed into some of the discussion that we do want to continue having about this album and release. Peter, Peter, Peter. P Peter's always kind of got this attitude um, in the way he looks at the releases. But I think there's a certain amount of fairness in what he does say. But he says his wording, uh, English is not his first language, but... Um, Really, guys, you guys need hearing aids. The new creature, the Night Remaster, is absolute crap. It almost sounds it sounds mostly loud, bordering on distortion. It lacks any detail and nuance that were excellent on the original and the still very good 1997 remaster. So sonically, how is the album doing for you? I'm not having any ear fatigue, which I would usually get from an album that is too loud, but there is certainly an argument to be made that there's a little bit more done than just making it mm. loud, but it's not brick walled. It certainly is not brick walled. I think it's decibel. Uh, it's DR range is kind of getting into the naughty zone. Well, it's actually in the naughty zone yeah, versus, yeah. versus uh, the 97 remaster, which was on the borderline. I think that was seven and the other one's now 11. Um, mm. Mark, Yes. Well, I'm going to address this because one factor that I think that's not being talked about is the way people listen to their music. Because, for example, I have my stereo downstairs, my turntable. I have a nice little, you know, uh, project turntable and I have these clips speakers downstairs and I don't have any thing in between no parametric eq no graphic eqs no nothing like that it's straight from the turntable to the powered speakers and that's how i listen to it so when i listen to it that way especially the blue vinyl three record that i got there the <clears throat> original album sounds a little bottom heavy it is a little loud 
but it's not as terrible as he makes it sound. But then again, I'm wondering how he listens to his stuff. Does he have one of those stereo systems where he has his bass jacked up to seven when he listens to stuff? Does he have his treble all the way rolled up to 10? I mean, nine out of 10 people that I know, when you go into their home stereos and take a look at it, they have these crazy graphic EQ settings on their systems where they're jacking up their bottom end and they're, they're, they're blasting out their top end and scooping out their mids. It's like, and then of course, if you put a, something like this on there, it's going to be like, dee, 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 dee. it's going to be like insane listening to it. So again, how are you listening to this is what I'm wondering, because if you're listening to it flat, like with no, you know, manipulation, it's going to be a different story. Now, sure, most people don't listen to those to their stuff in cars or maybe at home completely flat. But keep that in mind. You know, you, you, you the way you set your stereo will have a lot to do with the way that some of this stuff sounds, right? And don't yeah, forget, most, most modern cars have a preset for your bass. You know, yeah, you set exactly. up the sound system, you program it once, <laughs> you set it and forget it. Use that god awful yeah. phrase. Exactly. Um, I mean, my turntable is direct into my PC, and my tape deck is in through EQ because that's where I need the EQ because I'm bringing in bootlegs, you know, and I want to play around with the sound uh, before it hits the sound card rather yeah. than do post. But one last thing, I'll, I'll let you, I won't be much longer. Just this, this thing to. It suffers a little bit from that as well. I mean, I listen to it in my car with my normal settings. I listen to everything, and it is a little bottom heavy, not terrible. It isn't as bad as people are making it sound, but it is a little. And don't forget, this is supposed to be a, the big metal record, the big grandiose sounding production. So they made it, they kind of jumped up a bit. I agree with most people, though, that the 97 or 96, whatever this is, <clears throat> version of this album is much better to me. I think it sounds a lot better sonically. To, to my ears i mean that's that's just personal taste of course right but uh i i i don't think it's as bad as people think and again i think it all goes back to how are you setting your stereo yeah and how do you listen to your music ken how do you listen yeah. to your music yeah ken yeah <laughs> ken explain yourself a couple of ways uh actually well one way is exactly like mark's as far as as far as my turntable going straight into the powered speakers um mm -hmm. so that's one way um and then the other way i, I listened to the cd version a couple of ways but one of them was with uh earbuds um the apple ones you know and uh the the cd sounded fine to me um i, I didn't think it was distorted or anything it, it, it's it seemed fine to me i didn't nothing kind of jumped out at me um but the but the album um, the half speed master um, I thought when I put on the original and I, I played Creatures of the Night then I played the uh, half speed master it seemed quite you know it was quieter I had to turn it up so okay that's, interesting I, it, yeah it, it was just slightly quieter than the other one though you know you, again I think the clarity was a little a little bit better on the original versus the the new one but it, it's really close i mean it's it's nothing like you hear on some albums where it's totally you know just you know horrible compared to an original or something like that so that you know that's how i listen to it and uh you know i have no problems with them usually the original is better and it, it is <laughs> well yeah you're you're an huh? earbud person i would guess most of the time I am, and I think I listen to my music the way most of the country listens to their music. Two ears. Um, two ears <laughs> on my phone. Wow. Well, and I think that's the way most of the country listens to it. I mean, really, what's the first thing? Like, most people, what's the first thing they do when they get in their car? Is they plug their phone into their car. Mm -hmm. um, even at home, a lot of people, and I'm not saying and you guys listen to your turntables, and I listen, you know, I'm... I'm a '90s guy. I I still love my CDs. Yes, you know? yes, amen, brother. I love brother. my CDs, and I and I and here, go back and listen to the show. I said I still prefer my '97 remasters on the show last week. I love my '97 remasters. They're my favorite form of any kind of Kiss music. It's how I listen to my Kiss music. But um, for, if I'm in the mood for a Kiss album, I put on my '97 Kiss remasters. I don't listen to it on my phone. But even at home, with a lot of the times, I'm a lot of the times at home if I'm listening to music. 
I hook up a Bluetooth speaker to my phone, and that's how I listen to music. And I think that's how the majority of people just in general listen to the music. But the problem is, is I'm listening to it on a blue on just a Bluetooth speaker. I'm not listening to it, you know, through my good speakers and hearing all everything. The definition, you mean? Correct. I'm not hearing it in full stereo because I'm listening to it on one single speaker. Hmm. And but I think that's how a lot of the country listens. A lot well, of the world listens to their music. I think a lot of the a lot of the world under the age of thirty. I think. Yeah, I guess my you know I'm yeah, but it. But I think I'm 43. That's how I listen to my music, though, most of the time. I mean, I still yeah, like, 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 don't get me wrong. I love my CDs and I listen to them um, if I'm really in the mood for a particular album and I want to listen to that album. But if I'm just in the music, if I'm just in the mood to listen to Kiss, I mean, I just you know, pull up a Kiss playlist or I just put Kiss on, on random on my phone and, and off I go. But, but I do agree with you, though. The phone thing, like when I go into my car, I, I grab my phone a lot of times, put it in there and listen to it. But what I tend to do with the phone more is like I'll try to listen to albums that I don't have. Let's say on CD, like I'll find a playlist of like obscure prog albums and I'll listen to it off the phone mm. into the, the stereo. But don't forget too, in your car, you have the benefit also of stereo of to have decent stereo sound too. So sure. you can listen to it pretty good that way too. I haven't yet had the experience of listening through a, a singular speaker like how you do it. So I would I can't really comment on how that is because I haven't heard it that way yet. Yeah, I don't connect my phone to my car audio. I've got a USB stick that I reload every once in a while. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. And then I have 128 megs just that's always loaded um, in the car, and I need to load up, you know, all the stuff I've bought in the last year, basically. Well, mm. well, yeah, the whole Rolling Stones catalog needs to be in my car now because that's what I listen to <laughs> most of the time. Um, but also the the Kiss stuff. I I went out and I I did order the the replacement single CD edition. A couple of observations on this. Uh, obviously, it's the, I did want to compare and have the sing, the the listening experiences of the double CD, the single CD, and obviously the full box set. And so I'm a loser. Um, <laughs> but my observations on the packaging, I like how they've done the booklet similar to, you know, with the lyrics. I'm not happy about the CD print on this one because if you can see it, the title of the album is in blue. Mm. And I know it's in mm. blue on the inner dust sleeve of the original one, but I like that one much yeah. better that cd print just is just consistent so that's a, a pet peeve the other thing that jumps out is the clarity of the cover and i'll see if i can get this to show um there you go <laughs> there it is yeah. yeah you can you can only see it and and i think they had to rescan stuff in and didn't have the original photo yeah. stuff because the covers are darker and lack the clarity that even the 97 remaster had. So I, I don't know what the deal is with that, but that, that bugs me. Uh, the 2CD. I gotta say, this is a freaking good listening experience for people who can't stretch to the full box set or don't want to stretch to the full box set. It's an excellent goddamn sampler of the material that is featured on it. I'm a, bit, a little bit surprised that they kind of blow their load to a certain extent mm -hmm. on giving all the good stuff on here so that people don't actually need to i mean betrayed's on there don't leave me lonely guitar drum demo um mm -hmm. you know keep me coming rock and roll hell live those are the two core live recordings from the tour cd they're there you know not for the innocent obviously has been out there but the more i've read comments the more i realize is that we are so niche in our little arrogant collector community fan mm -hmm. uh, yeah. community that we think Oh, it's common as muck and to so many people even on my facebook it was new and i'm like holy shit guys that's been out like 20 years um where have you been you know losers um living, living their lives no, apparently no Julia said it right we're the losers we are <laughs> no we are totally the losers because i see all that excitement and we can never go back and recapture that and unbottle it so it's a good marketing thing, though, too, because if they're going to buy this, you get different songs here versus the the double CD. Um, Do you? So, yeah, right. No, there's no different songs. No, no, they no, pull, no. they're not Guns N' Roses. They no, they're just, they're the same. This is yeah. exactly this. 
Oh, yeah. okay. This I is exactly the same. Yeah. As the CD. No, yeah. It, yeah. they did the right thing, in, in okay. my opinion, by keeping it the same. But <laughs> it's, it's, a, coming and going. it's a really good, um, more importantly than that, Literally. and Mark, I think you've got the double CD, triple LP. Yeah. It's a yeah. great listening experience. I mean, disc one is obviously the album, uh, but that CD two flows really well. Mark, yes, I, I I agree. Honestly, this is this has been the thing that's been living in my car and living in my downstairs CD player for most of the weeks since since I've gotten it. Because I honestly think that the one thing I've really really enjoyed about this release is that I can picture and hear the development of this happening they, they give you the benefit of giving you some early demos of stuff that they were working on after the el after the elder stuff happened like you know like you have like the uh d deadly weapon stuff and stuff like that that was early early on and then you go on to some of the later things like the killers material that they put out later on right i mean you get to listen to some of that stuff before right and then you can listen to some of the stuff that they did when they were working on here so the the, the whole journey of this record is nicely put on here. I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. And of course, if you want to go even more deeper into it, when you get the box set, because fortunately I had the audio of the box set, you, you have more of it in there as well to enjoy from the journey of the making of this record. And really, the, this album, which I found on what was one of my earliest vinyl purchases I got, I got the import copy of this on vinyl. It was at my record store. I remember it clear as day because I was always wondering, that I always thought that that cover was really weird, weird when I saw it the first time. And that album and this album were some of my earliest listens as a Kiss fan. So these, this album really has a good place in my heart musically. And I mean, it, it still to this day, when I hear this stuff, it, it always brings a smile on my face. It's my kind of hard rock metal music that I grew up and loved. And I loved that Kiss was doing at that time. So uh, I think that the two disc is great and i said it before in our other thing that i said if you can't afford the box set get this or get the three lp because this gives you everything you really need and the booklet is great as well fills in a lot of the you know information that you need as well yeah so lonnie someone took us to task for not mentioning and being psyched enough about ace fairly on the penny lane demos so would you please be very <laughs> excitable and psyched and talk about the penny lane demos for a little bit and those are pre-elder well, I did mention that the Penny Lane demos were my favorite thing on this too, actually. Yeah. Um, was actually, so there, actually there, there you go. It's like, actually what I said on the show. It's yeah. just my favorite thing on this too, mm -hmm. is the Penny Lane you did. demos. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't mention Ace Fairly, but um, the Penny Lane demos are actually fantastic. And um, Right, but you know Ace Fairly plays guitar on those. And, right? and by the way, Ace Fairly plays on those, and they're my go-to. They're, they're, they've become kind of a go-to like or, or a starting point if I'm if I'm going to sit down if I'm not sit down I hardly sit down if I'm just going to be if I'm going to be listening to, um you know some some of this creature stuff it's it's a it's a good starting point actually for me so no that that Penny Lane stuff is fantastic and I did mention on on, on the last episode it's my favorite it's my, it might be my favorite thing on there. I think that the inclusion of the Penny Lane stuff clears up a mystery. And that was Michael James Jackson when he did an assortment of podcasts and appearance interviews. He did say that he remembered Ace in the studio. I think we finally have an understanding, or at least I do, of how he could have become mixed up by that now that we see that mm. the reel was copied. And, and that's one of the things that is a bummer because it looks like it's a mixed down reel that was copied. But I can understand him now saying, well, that's Ace in the studio. Well, yeah, so he was involved with Ace in the studio, Ace's material from, you know, early 1981. So I think that that once and for all clears up, in my mind anyway, how um, Jackson got confused between that, because there's no other evidence that Ace was anywhere near the studio at any time uh, for the rest of it. Let's go into some more of, or of the comments. Ken, yeah. got anything to say? No, I, I I kind of agree with the you know the Penny Lane demos are you know a, a really big deal, cool stuff, um, and then the other things that you know came out as far as you know the in in studio chatter that goes on you know before yeah. 
yeah. tracks and stuff like that. Yeah, because somebody mentioned that too. Because somebody on there said he goes, "Hey, if I'm, I, I might be mistaken, but I could have sworn I heard Ace count in a song on the box set, like that mm-hmm. he actually was one, two, mm-hmm. three. So yeah, so. so then yeah. yeah, so he is on it. <clears throat> Yeah, he he's on five songs, at least five yeah. songs. You know, I don't know about some of Gene's other demos uh, from the period, but certainly the three Penny Lane cuts, he is on, you know, guitar with Paul, and he does the solo to only one of those, and then he's on uh, presumably at least one of the other two demos, uh, Deadly Weapons, because, again, he's prompted to do the solo uh, yeah. for the Deadly, Wem- totally Deadly Weapons one. And that, I mean... Now, in my mind, it's clear about the solo phrasing, which I uh, I was always on the fence about because there are some little techniques in there that he wasn't known for. And now you hear them on that demo. You hear it on the studio overdubs. Um, So it all adds clarity. So I I love what this is doing to clear up both 81 and 82. Um, Psycho Circus is the same as Creatures. Well, psych- and to frame so, that yeah. that comment, uh, a- again, <laughs> it's that in 1998, the band gets back together, goes into the studio, and Gene and Paul are forced by circumstances to bring in session players to complete an album. And that is a pretty good summing up of what happened in 1982, that they go into the studio and they have to complete recording it with a plethora of studio players but that whole comparison feels filthy to me ken Mm. yeah i mean uh (laughs) i saw the comparison uh it was brought up on the board and uh but the the key thing there too is um they were kind of riding uh they're on top of the world kind of after the reunion and all that so they wanted to put this album out um, or the, maybe the, the, the label on them to put mm-hmm. them out. But uh, the, the other thing is uh, the, another key ingredient difference is that you don't have Michael James Jackson producing psycho circus. I think he, we would have gotten something a lot different had he been the producer. I'm almost surprised that he wasn't approached and I don't know if he was really producing much anymore after. I don't know his track record after, if he was doing a lot of that. I know another option was uh, they talked about uh, um, Bob Ezrin and so on. But uh, yeah, I, that's that's a key difference for me. Uh, the, mm-hmm. the producer not yeah. being Michael James Jackson, I think he would have he would have maybe brought in more outside writers, like he did in Creatures, and probably nixed certain things. Um, and maybe it would have worked better. I, I don't know, but yeah, it, 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 I can see the similarities and, you know, a lot of session work and different players are playing on this and that and that sort of stuff. It, it's kind of disjointed in that, in that mm. fashion. Uh, and the album's kind of disjointed in a way. So like it doesn't flow as, as creatures does creatures, even though it's a lot of different people playing mm. on it, it sounds like one band still, you mm. know, so. Yeah, def- yeah, definite unity. Fairburn knew how to work with difficult bands. I mean, he'd done what three albums with Aerosmith. So you want to talk about difficult people? <laughs> there, there, there's a bunch of them in that band. Um, but again, yeah. for me, it comes down to willfulness. You know, it, it's like the the difference between murder mm-hmm. and homicide. Well, one, the end result is that someone's dead, but in one you meant to do it, in the other one you didn't, and that's kind yeah. of the psycho circus is murder, and <clears throat> creatures of the night is more homicide. You know, they were just dealing with circumstances the best they could, and in 1998 they weren't willing to deal with circumstances, and they were just like, forget it, we're we're gonna go do it, it versus does. we gotta go do it in '82. Mm. Mark. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the main difference, though, is in 82, they kind of had to get outside writers. They were they needed people to help them get back on track. They were kind of lost themselves as far as who they were as Kiss uh, to a degree. And I think they also, you know, it was they, they lost a guy. You know, Ace didn't want to participate in it, you know. And the difference is Psycho Circus, they had those guys back, you know. But they just didn't want to use them. I think there's a little bit of a difference there between not being able to use them and not wanting to use them. You know what I mean? So 
I think there there's one of the differences too, right? Because it, hey, they they could have easily went and did the whole record with those guys. Sure, it would have been a totally different record if Peter and Ace played on every single song on that album. It would have been totally different. But you know, some people might argue that it might have been a better record for that. But uh, I don't think Michael James Jackson was doing anything. I don't think he was doing diddly squat in that time period. I could be wrong, but I don't remember ever reading anything about him doing anything at that time period either. So I think that he was not, he was a non-factor, I think, as far as that goes for, uh, you know, what's going on with that. But, you know, to, to, to me, they're, 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 it's, it's apples and oranges to me. I mean, it's, because they didn't have to, you know, get other people for for Psycho Circus. That's what that's what primarily makes it different to me. I mean, sure, you can say, yeah, they weren't playing ball and they wanted money and this and that. But at the end of the day, if they really wanted to, if they wanted Ace and Peter to play on it, they could have gotten them to do it. Yeah, Ace recorded demos. Peter recorded demos. Lonnie? You know, they're, they're similar in the fact that they put um individuals on the cover of the albums who maybe didn't play on these albums <laughs> um but i think and there's similar in the fact you know like you guys are saying that you know we, we we brought in people this and that um but the biggest difference is the material creatures and nights is just better material than psycho circus yeah and there's just there's no comparison when when you just look at songs for songs i mean <laughs> the creatures of the night is. I mean, no one, no one is. No one's gonna have a. Uh, you you know, wanted the best. You know, album, album for album, song for song. Creatures of the night versus Psycho Circus. It's gonna be a split decision. I mean, I think that if you, if we want to put a poll up on on the board, which which album do you like better, Creatures or Psycho Circus? I mean, it's. I think one's gonna win about ninety five to five. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I mean, they're they're similar in ways of maybe deception. I, I can see that point, and but as far as, I mean, at the same time, how many bands do the same thing? So, yeah, um, I think that I think they're 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 far different at the end of the day. Julian, are you putting up a poll? Michael, Michael, James no, I'm, I'm, I'm actually I'm actually <laughs> counting. Um, we've we've all seen the A, B, and C list for the Psycho Circus albums, and how many of Gene's shitty songs were on the list, and how many of them mm-hmm. still made the album. And I'm just looking at the list of songs um, that Michael James and Gene went over. These are primarily Gene songs, and there are 15 of them. And how many of them made the album? Um, Three? Zero. Oh, oh really? Really? And I think that's part of the key. These are songs from other songwriters as well as songs that mm-hmm. are clearly Gene, some of which date back to 1977 that were, were revisited. So, yeah, let me just... Yeah, they, they only cut one demo um, during the killer sessions for one of these, and the rest of them... Yeah. Gene, Gene had demoed, but Michael didn't well, even put the kibosh on it. Yeah. Where, whereas Bruce Fairburn seemed to to be willing to shoehorn stuff like You Wanted the Best and Within mm. uh, and subpar Gene Simmons stuff, and that they were willing as well, and this is down to Doc, um, to, to not have that involvement from Peter and Ace. I mean... I finally found my way to you. Are you really telling me that Peter couldn't come up with something as equally bad as that? Yeah. Talk about yeah. shoehorning stuff in there. I finally found my way. Yeah. You I, wanted the best. Good I mean, Lord. why? It, it really was a political business decision then, clearly, that if they're willing to put that on, that crap sandwich, that's right up there with nothing can keep me from you. In terms mm. of possibly what will be in the top of many Kiss fans' worst of Kiss lists, yes. But there was other songs recorded that, that were better that uh, they left out yeah. of, you know, Psycho Circus. So, yeah. but there was an agenda. There was an agenda but, and a yeah. total formula that we have to have the ballad for Peter. We have to have one A song, you know, and it wasn't going to be more than one A song. And don't don't kid yourself. That's the yeah. way it was going to be. 
And and that the thing is though too, uh, as dumb as it sounds, you, because Ken mentioned earlier, he goes, you know, whether the band wanted to do the album or whether the record company wanted to do the album. There's a video that that was leaked just recently on here of uh, Kiss having a, a dinner with Doc and the guys at some house before the the the, in, the intrepid press conference. It, it that leaked on here, and they're at the dinner talking, and Gene is clearly heard saying during that dinner about a new kiss record during then even before the intrepid press conference so they must have known mm. they were going to do a kiss record way back even as far back as then but it's well, like, five year you, you wanted the best was the new record well yeah. uh, you think that's what they were talking about at that point no they, they i think they're just spitballing at that point they knew they yeah. could just go in and do an album I, I really believe in that they had to number one and see if they could keep it together um, to get to doing an album and not kill each other, which mm-hmm. you know they clearly did, but I think they wasted too much time in between the end of the tour and going into the studio. Yeah. You know that basically they took the second half of '97 off, and mm-hmm. that's where the more time you have off, the more time you have to come up with dumb ideas, and then the yes. more time you actually have to even implement them. So mm-hmm. they don't go into the studio until January, or yeah, or I think it's early January '98. And just way too much time. I mean, it's such a shame. Bob Ezrin was busy, you know, getting his own company off the ground because he was moving into multimedia at that point mm-hmm. and had a startup going, so it wasn't able to to function. Um, I put enough about Psycho Circus. Just gets me, gets me upset. <laughs> just, so just one thing. Mike, uh, Michael James Jackson was. I was looking. He's, he was still producing and he was composing uh, during the time period. For instance, at nineteen ninety. <clears throat> I think it was six or or ninety nine. He Paul, he produced Paul Williams a, a Paul Williams album. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, he had, had some other stuff going on in the nineties. Um, you know, so he had fallen off the radar. But his you know adventures into working with rock and roll acts, and you know, he worked with Hurricane. He did L.A. Guns. That <clears throat> their third album didn't go anywhere. L.A. Guns in ninety five. Yeah, uh, ninety one. Oh. Vicious Circle, 95. Yeah, I think he only did a couple of the songs, but he did the full Hollywood Vampires, okay. um, or whatever it is, uh, album. always forget, it's the one where they tried to go a bit more AOR. Um, you can rent, did you know this, you can rent Aces, Ace in the Hole. Oh, I saw that. 10,000 a month, 29 Tito Lane. Let's all put our money together and... Uh... But yeah, it's an actual right. functioning studio. <laughs> no, it's not. It's uh, it's been revamped as a, a beautiful residence, but it is uh, now kind of a, available on a monthly rent basis. Uh, but it mm, looks absolutely gorgeous. You can go stand where they would have jammed those Penny Lane studio. Uh, you know, the bed that Ace really played on. Yeah, thank you, Lonnie. <laughs> nice. Could always, could always count on Lonnie. All right, let's let's talk about. Uh, some kiss stuff that's a little bit more current they played in japan the other night what do you guys think about the set list change the uh emergence of the first new song performed during the end of the road making love, and making love. mark wow mm. uh you can you can see the excitement on my face about that yeah, yeah you settle, know. settle down don't, don't yeah don't get so excitable i'm gonna have to turn the volume down yeah, I know. I, I I was trying to contain myself here because you know it's it's a big moment in Kiss here. You know, I it's mean, like just after, yeah, like just just after I got super excited about the fact. Now, I promise I'm not going to direct this to something different. This is I have a point here. Just after I found out that Metallica dropped a new album, uh, and and now also are touring in 2023, doing two shows in each city. And not only that, but changing set lists each night, a different set lists every night that they play, okay? And different cover, and different cover, different opening bands, okay? You know, the, I'm so tired of Gene with this, showing everybody how the big boys do it. I'm sorry, Gene, you guys are now looked at as complete kindergarten in my eyes, because when a band like Metallica can step up and start doing stuff like this, they're the big boys now. You guys are not. You guys are no longer the big boys in this musical field, because the, the, they come up with the great ideas now. You guys don't. You guys just rehash the same thing over and over and over and over again. 
I, I, I love this idea that they did, that they're going out there and doing different sets each night, playing different songs. And don't, you know, I, and I know they're going to say, oh, you, they can't do that. Kiss can't do that. It's this and that. You know, they, you can find excuses for everything, okay? If you want to do it, you can do it, okay? And Metallica, hat, my hat's off to them. You know, if, if the most excitement that we have on a Kiss tour right now is that they're going to be playing Making Love during the set list, then wow. That's that's we've we've really hit a low point. Okay, where's your point? Sorry, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you think about making love? <laughs> yes, no, actually, what what did you think of that new Metallica song? Because uh, I loved it. I, I loved I thought, it. I thought it was kick ass. Yeah, and I, I think it's they, great. But they, they they've been okay the last few years. But I, I, again, when's the last? Well. When's the last time Metallica didn't shake it up a lot? I mean, that's just part of their DNA. You go and watch any of their their tour videos throughout the past few years, and very seldom will you get the same shit night after night. They actually seem to make it a part of their process to kick things around and to bring songs into the set. They actually seem to have notebooks where they see how many times they performed, um, you know, a song Mm -hmm. live and then pick one that is lesser performed. Whereas Kiss isn't that creature. And I think we got to get over that, that Kiss is not that beast anymore. Gene is 70. He's old. Paul is old. It's got to be tough on the road for those guys. They've got a good 10, 15 years on the guys in Metallica, you know, and even though they're getting on and I'm actually respecting them a hell of a lot more now for their performances because it doesn't get any easier. No. You know, they, they're still dialing in a different sort of show. Lonnie. You know, um, I thought the addition of Making Love was interesting. Uh, I didn't expect it at all. Uh, am I am I like doing cartwheels over it? No, but we've been saying for I mean this tour's been going on for I don't know since since nineteen at this point since January of nineteen this the tour's been going on. We've been asking for for something different for a while, and and they gave they gave us something different. I I think I think two weeks ago. If we would have said, or just last week, we would have said, hey, do you think they're going to do anything different in Japan? It would have been a resounding no from the four of us. It'll be the exact same set list they've been doing for the last how many years? So they threw something in there. Um, I, for one, was a little appreciative that they at least threw me a freaking bone. For You know what I mean? Well, so, since you flew all the way to Japan, bought tickets, and went to that show, it, yeah, they did yeah. it just for Lonnie. Well, mm. no. But I mean, no, I mean, I just thought it was that it was, it was cool. They did something different, you know. And I, I think people that were in attendance were probably like, you know, people What's who did fly, people who did fly to the show <laughs> or, or here. Our friend friend of the show, Alan, I'm sure was there, and he he might have been like, oh, geez, what the hell? They're playing Making Love. That's great. So I'm not doing cartwheels over it, but you know, I they did surprise me the fact that they did change it up at least a little bit. Um. What the few, we have one more show left in 2022 in, in Mexico, so we'll see. Does, does making love stay? For the show that you really want to stay? sing that to the Mexican crowd? Well, I don't, we'll, we'll have to wait and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, if, if you were to ask me a week ago, what are they uh, if they add a song to the set in Japan, what's it going to be? I might have stretched to I Want You because they did that on the cruise. And that's a little bit more accessible. And obviously the recording from Alive 2 is from Japan um, earlier that year. So I, I would make in love. I, I never would have. I, that, that I would have thought would be a Paul destroyer of a song. You know, like Got to Choose. Got to Choose, I think, probably would have been a more likely um, selection as well. So I, I think Lonnie nails it from my perspective. They did something new. That's something to get excited about. Whether it stays in the set or not, it, if it even became a rotating song, say Do Crazy Nights or Strutter or Making Love, you know, going into shows next year, I'm like, well, they're changing it up. You know, you have to be happy when this band kind of creaks forward ever so slightly. They'll never be Metallica and doing two different, completely different back-to-back sets. Um, just ain't going to happen. we got to get get over the comparisons. 
and just know that it's close enough to being over that it really doesn't matter. <laughs> Ken. Yeah, while, while it's nice, I, it is good that they, they tried something um, and, and and did that song. Um, and it probably sounded better or in person versus on YouTube um, because it, it kind of... That's our standard dis- excuse. It kind of feels disjointed vocally from the other Paul, you know, sung songs because they didn't use a you know a track for him on that one, and I'm kind of almost surprised that they did it really. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's kind of it's cool. Again, it's cool they 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 did something different for once, and you know we were always always asking for something new but yeah I, i'm just surprised they didn't like take a track from they probably played that song maybe during the las vegas stint they did you know years ago i i don't know if they did for sure or not um they could have used a vocal from that or something to, to help um but but you know it paul must have felt you know he wanted to pull out that song and do it i don't know what the reason for picking that song is it's kind of interesting to me to try to think about you know why did they pick that song in particular? Uh, what was it about that? Was did Eric Singer say, "Hey, let's, why don't we play something"? Anniversary of or, a life or, too. Or uh, yeah, mm, yeah, it could it could be go. do something with a live too and sell some more merch. Uh, you see the merch <laughs> promote stands. It. Holy I, shit! The merch yeah. stands were insane as always. Yeah. yeah. My God, so, my my Hello Kitty <laughs> dreams are overflowing <laughs> with kiss shit. Uh, Julian, I'm curious, or you guys, did you guys see that there was a post on Facebook? Uh, I don't know if it was from a podcast or something else, but there was a picture of Gene, and it says, the last date of the tour has been announced and the location. Or Anybody decide, heard about this? Or it's been decided. I'm, announced, sure, it, I'm yeah. sure it's decided in his head. It's whether known. He's, he said whether, known. whether he's had yeah. that conversation with Paul is a whole different matter. Oh, okay. I just wondering because I saw it on the, just before I came on here. No, and I was like, come on. Wondering we, if anybody... we, we, we're, we're so close to it. You know how long it takes to book a tour and get venues yeah. and get on, on get the whole dates Somewhere done and the promoters. You, you know that they know what it is. Um, yeah. or, or have a very good idea, and the people involved do. Um, we're not going to find out. What did we find out this week? Two more Spanish dates, I think, for the summer. So that's slowly mm. trickling out um, in, in terms of that. But Gene, again, Gene, Gene is one of the biggest leakers when it comes to Kiss. Uh, <laughs> don't forget, he's the one who leaked the Creatures the creature. box set coming yeah, out. I'm hoping so he leaks just, the next box set. Yeah, I hope he keeps his mouth shut. Um Talking of Gene, he was actually in the New Guitar World interview, and uh, there'll be quite a few interviews coming up, um, which before I talk about this quote, or have you guys talk about this quote, I do want to just give a shout out to Three Sides, who had David Leaf on this week's episode, and he, of course, um, was behind the mask, behind the makeup, I always get the mask backwards, um, co-written with Ken Sharp, and it included his abandoned 1979 book that he was working on that was supposed to be the band's first, like, proper um, biography, mm-hmm. and he gives the backstory as to why that got shit-canned in favor of uh, the real the, Kiss story. Which the real was, story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a completely different beast, obviously, so... Yeah. Do check that out. It is well worth your time to get that sort of story of of the first-hand account of it. All right, getting back to Gene, the quote. Everything Vinnie Vincent did sounded like Ingve Malmsteen on crack. (laughs) Lonnie, do you think that is fair, or do you think that's Gene shouting, get off my lawn again? It's totally Gene shouting, get off my lawn again. I mean, it's not fair. I mean, I know there's people that put Vinny on a pedestal. I know there's people who don't like Vinny at all because Gene just, man, there's Kiss fans who don't like Vinny at all just because of the simple fact that Gene and Paul don't like Vinny. So, you know, everything that comes out of Gene and Paul's mouth is gospel. So I don't like Vinny. So that's not fair. Vinny did a lot of good things for Kiss. You can say, you can say what you want about him personally, this and that. But, I mean, he did a lot of good things for Kiss in some really hard years for him. And he, they did Vinny a disservice on those. As much as I talked about the live stuff when the show started, they, they 
you know, like they cut Vinny Solo and the live stuff and that they weren't about to feature him. And I get it. But th- to say that about him, that, that's not fair. I mean, it's, it's, it's just him spewing. And, you know, we, we've, we've come to know it and we've come to expect it. And I think I, like a lot of KISS fans, or a lot of KISS fans watching this, probably just saw that, rolled their eyes, and just moved on. Like, whatever. You know, why don't you just talk about, why don't you just talk about Ace and Peter and drugs and alcohol while we're at it? Type of well, he did. Um... Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that is well. You know, I, I think it's unfortunate because Vinny circa 1982 was not, and not Yngwie Malmsteen wasn't Yngwie Malmsteen in 1982 either. Sure. I mean, he was playing some very Baroque um, inspired metal riffs, but he hadn't kind of reached the Bumblebee stage that he would later um, do. Mark St. John certainly sounds like Yngwie on crack at times to me. That's more yeah. fair. That That is fair, but... <laughs> But Vinny, his whole black background was a very Becky and blues inspired playing, which then became corrupted clearly. Um, and it was probably that case in the studio as well. Though you listen to Warrior and what's he doing in the studio at the same time with that band? Ain't no bumblebees near that. Mark, uh, talk some common sense because I'm probably waffling. Um, well, I mean, look, you, you hit the nail right on the head. The, the the bumble being was yet to come. I mean, like Vinnie Vincent invasion and stuff like that. That's where he started going off the rails a bit <clears throat> guitar wise. But at this point, he wasn't really doing that. And, and you, put a, you brought up a good point too. In 82, I don't even think Ingrid Malmsteen's first solo album was out yet, even at that point. So, I mean, he, like you said, Ingrid wasn't even doing the crazy stuff that he was doing yet at that point. But I can maybe see a little bit of st- like let's put it this way i think where people get a little bit perturbed with vinny is that when you listen to like let's say the live tracks that are on this release the creatures one yeah he doesn't seem to follow a lot of aces licks on there he very much vinnies them up you know and sometimes people get a little you know bunched up in the pants with stuff like that when people do that right so i i think that you know if you if you just let him be who he is and interpret it the way he does then you can enjoy it for what it is right but if if you're expecting him to play like ace then yeah you're gonna have a bit of a problem with it because he's nothing like ace that way but you you know that i i think that paul and gene have major issues with the guy because i think that he they cut out a lot of his stuff on some of these releases you know like even the i think some of his guitar solos like the guitar solo proper i don't even think is on the box set is it the his unaccompanied one so that there you go nope. that kind of shows how much they love that performance and to be fair some of those solo performances were a little sketchy and like i said before i think it all boils down to the fact that kiss is a very visual band and maybe if you were seeing it and watching him do the solo maybe it might have been a little bit more entertaining than just hearing it right but uh and, you know, I, I think Vinny at this point isn't as bad as everybody makes it sound to be. I mean, the, the worst was yet to come. Yeah, you know what? The victors write the history. Mm-hmm. And that is just simply fact that Vinny did not leave the band on good terms, did not have a good relationship with them in many cases throughout. While they brought him back in 92 to write, that didn't end particularly well either. And then, of course, was a long, drawn-out um, legal battle that went to the Supreme Court. Um, there's a price to pay for that. Mm. So the, the victors hold that wallet. And I don't know whether there are uh, compositional parts to a guitar solo, whether if that had been included, that would have been a payment for him because it didn't fall under some arrangement or what. I don't know if there are technical details um, that would lead to why it was omitted, but it simply is. And uh, again, I I don't find that I miss it tremendously. Um, Mm -hmm. Again, you've got the original source material leaked out there in its entirety so you can go listen to what four or five different 
copies of a uh, <laughs> sorry of Vinny solo and Vinny playing Aces solos um, to get your hearts content. But on an official Kiss product, nothing surprises me because it's an official Kiss product, and there are a lot more factors involved than we'll ever be aware, um, other than the emotion of they. They're doing it to slight Vinny. Vinny's doing a perfect mm -hmm. job of doing that on his own without any help from anyone. <laughs> Just look at his latest uh, party gathering. Um, but I do think mm. calling him Ingve on crack is unfair. Ingve hadn't even released an album yet in 82. Steeler was late 83, Alcatraz follows, and then his first mm -hmm. solo album at the end of 84, Rising Force. So completely unfair and that style of playing wasn't even in the equation and people are going to see what they want to say i actually prefer all systems go to invasion because it is more melodic and it is more restrained which is why Vinny hates it but i think that's much better composition and playing uh because any idiot can play super fast well not really but not have it sound good all right there we go that's probably enough topics, unless any of you have anything that you would like to add. Mark? I would just say, give me melody over fast playing, you know, a melodic solo, solo over fast playing any any day. Um, 100%. 100%. You know, yeah. that's why, you know, you know Ace was, it was, you know, so great. Uh, always melodic type solos that, that he had. Um, though, even though we know Bruce could play you know very fast and do a lot of different things he had he had he kept aces little nuances there but then you know put in his own little flavor on on it um which was you know tasteful and then tommy we don't give him enough credit for at least you know nailing all of nailing yeah replicating all of uh aces solos uh yeah Vinny was kind of hard to i can see where people come from and I'm probably one of them that, I, you know, like, man, I wish he wouldn't have butchered, you know, Ace's solo so much, you know, or you couldn't, you couldn't even recognize the no. solo at all. I mean, just imagine that's, Vinny that's Vincent with a coloring book. Vinny, you have to stay within the lines. <laughs> yeah. I'll do what I want. <laughs> yeah, man, yeah. You use a spray can. Oh, you know, so. yeah. yeah. Burn it. The pyromaziah has come. <laughs> No. <laughs> that said, I do like guitar some hell. I really do, uh, which which is weird. I, I, I do find it interesting, but I don't listen to a lot of that guitar zan crap. I mean, I like Satriani, love Crystal Planet, love surfing. Um, you know, th those are probably my two go-tos from him. Love Yngwie, um, I, Alchemy, Facing the Animal, uh, some of the later stuff I, I yeah. really dig. And then you have a different sort of melodic sense in Trilogy, Rising Force, and Marching Odyssey. Out. Oh, Odyssey. Eclipse. Yes. And Fire and yeah. Ice is, is kind of a forgotten gem uh, to mm. a certain extent because that was, what the, I think, the one Electra release uh, that was yeah. way off the radar. So, you know, again, Ingve isn't a bumblebee either. Yeah, he can play fast, and some of it gets a little bit repetitive and turgid, but some of the better produced stuff actually sounds really good. It's got a great mm -hmm. warmth to it, and also you get a lot of that classical inspiration or neoclassical uh, coming through. But Vinny's none of that. You, uh, mm -hmm. And I'd like to hear Himalaya, which is supposed to be a uh, kind of Ingve-ish type guitar uh, bumblebee thing. But I don't think we're ever going to hear any new music from from uh, Ingve. Which uh, I wanted to end just on a quick thing with, with Mark. Where are you at with your records? Well, the the good news is that uh, Train Records contacted me today, saying that uh, everything is in hand and that everything is uh, getting ready to get finalized and wrapped up finally. So in the next week or two. Hopefully, I will have everything in my hands and I'll be ready to be shipped off to people. Now, the only thing that I'm a little concerned about is if it comes right before Christmas, you know how the flurry is at the postal offices at that point and how things be, get lost in the mail. going to be any flurry around Christmas time into the new year because you know that it's backlogged and pointless. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, that, that that's the thing. I'm 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 just almost wondering if it's just better to wait till uh, the day after Christmas to go to the postal office and get, start doing looking at it after Christmas than before. Because you know, last thing I need is to have people saying, "Oh, mine didn't arrive. It got lost in the mail or whatever." You know, because it, th- that happens quite a lot during the Christmas holidays. You know, I mean, I remember sending half a dozen Christmas cards and some of them didn't even show up, and that's just Christmas cards. You know, yeah. so. I sent. I actually did my Christmas cards on Thanksgiving and got them out because last year a lot of them didn't get to England within three weeks. Wow, and that's insane. That that's just pathetic. But it is what it is. We deal with it. We'll look forward to that. I'm actually going to England again uh, soon, so um, I don't want your records to be ready too quickly. Um, just for, <laughs> just for selfish reasons. All yeah, right. I I wouldn't worry about that. All right, that's it. We, we, we're we creatured out, I think. Next week, we'll definitely do a different topic and maybe get back to the death match. Um, and if not, if you have any topic suggestions that you'd like us to uh, stick our hive mind to, we'd certainly be receptive to those ideas mm-hmm. because after 444 episodes, we know we start repeating ourselves um, mm-hmm. and we're into a quiet time of year that it'd be great to have the season of joy spread some of your topics that you want us to talk about. So let us know wherever you do listen to this on Facebook, I'd say on Twitter, but I'm not there anymore. Um, On Facebook, (laughs) on YouTube, and on the FAQ, of course, and anywhere else. And uh, maybe we'll take on one of your topics and structure a show around it. All right, that's it for now. From Lonnie, Ken, Mark, and myself, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for spending time listening to the KISS FAQ podcast today. All sales are final. There are no refunds. If you'd like, look us up on Facebook or come over to the KISS FAQ message board and discuss the topic we've broadcast today. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes, Spreaker, or wherever you've listened to the show. We hope you'll join us again.